see how many voices you <laughs> recognize because that's going to be a pretty amazing well, show tonight at 5 30. absolutely my settings are correct so i don't understand what's going on i wonder how scott sounds in syria he sounds pretty good <laughs> Like, like I'm on the right side of my mic right now, and I'm on the left side over here. Okay, that's yes, your setting controls that, Scott, in Zoom. You Dave Winter, have I love your backdrop. Hey, I got a question. Can you guys hear me in stereo? Oh, thank no. you. No? No. We have a my big settings setup. are enabled, uh, Curtis. So are mine. So Zoom must have done a nasty on us or something, because... We're definitely it's not because I came in. <laughs> I promise you. I really promise it's because I came in. Uh, maybe I better go on to the website and check the. Because I looked in my Zoom client and it says stereo, and I've been up and down, up and down a couple times. Yeah, I'm showing stereo too. Um, Weird. What about if and I the leave the meeting and come back in? Uh, yeah, you could and make try you host, that. Make you host or something temporarily. Yeah, do, okay. Yeah, we could try that. Currently unmuted. Technology is fantastic when it works. It is when it works. That's the caveat of all caveats. It, uh, it typically works. Okay, so it says I'm the host now. Let's see what happens. Let's try. Let's get some. Uh, <clears throat> here we go. Okay, here we go. We're not on YouTube now either, are we? We no. are. We, we yes, we are. Be. I we just are? started it again, yeah. Oh, oh, you did? Okay, because I checked. I okay. started it before I left. That sounds stereo. That's stereo. Okay, yeah. so what happened? What happened, Scott? I, uh, I got tossed off in the middle of that, that, that last um, meeting. I got knocked offline. And I think when I came back in, for whatever reason, that's what knocked off our, our stereo. Weird. Okay. It's also possible that only the host can do stereo because when I did it before, I was co host. So let's stop this. And Paul, why don't you flip us around and make me? Oh, I can't. I have to do this, don't I? Hold on. Okay. All yep, right. I'm so, co host now. So yeah, I'm going to. Paul. <laughs> So, you, oh, I know who you are. Never mind. So, Paul and yeah. Curtis, when uh, the dogs are done a little later on, when they've barked up the tree and do whatever they do, uh, <laughs> we'll we'll get together and do a few tests before definitely. Three. Okay. Okay. So I'm one minute, we're going to get diversity and inclusion underway. Yeah, I'm loving the crowd. We're getting a great car crowd, Darian. And uh... okay, now make me a co-host. <coughs> Actually, I don't have to. Hang on. See if the stereo still holds. Seems like we are truly in the room, or it happens. This till the season comes yeah, I think it is. Again. Sounds stereo. Let's... Okay, so whatever Paul did, he fixed it. Yay, Paul. You're I don't get the stereo sound on my end anymore. Hmm. Well, we'll fool with this later, but uh, let's let's move to the diversity and inclusion breakout okay. session. Uh, I heard Darian. I assume you're leading this. Uh, I, the note I got for the agenda said Mo, but I think she's working today, if I remember correctly. Or are you here, Mo, on your lunch break or something? <laughs> this anyway. is Renee. I'm here. And you're here? Mo Who's leading me, this? Renee, I am. You're Mo leading asked it? Me, Mo asked me to go ahead and step okay. to her. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Curtis, I don't know if you can cue it up, but let's let's give a big round of applause for Renee Anderson. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I caught Curtis uh, off guard there. He's got a nice Thanks, little Scott. applause track that we... Sorry about that. We weren't ready. Are you ready now? 
Um, just hang on. Okay, we'll, we'll do this again. <laughs> I mean, it's because you got to have the proper uh, sure. introduction, you know. I mean, it's the inclusion and diversity. Come yeah. on. Yeah. And the uh, and <laughs> maybe for we'll keep it's, mixing uh, this up. I'll have Curtis find it. Like I'm music. ready. Trump. All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for the queen of the Rocky Mountains, the president of our Mountain and Plains chapter, the chief diversity and inclusion expert this afternoon, Renee Anderson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. standing ovation there you go oh there is such, <laughs> such was a awesome. great crowd thank you guys so much um so welcome to the diversity and inclusion um uh division meeting today or seminar that we are doing we have a lot of different things that we're going to share today and first off we want this to be a safe place for everyone and a brave place for everyone. Um, we will be talking about what it means to be diverse, what it means to include, and how we all need to, to look at these things and see how, how we can be a part of this. Um, we have a guest speaker today. His name is Anaya Robinson. He is from, actually, he works with um, Atlantis Community. And I, I met Alan, I met Atlantis. No, I met Anaya a couple of years ago at a CCDC state meeting, and I, I um, thought he was a cool, cool guy then. And then this last September, I guess that was just a month ago. Gosh, it seems forever ago. Um, I was in a, a meeting with him, and I was very impressed with the way he 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 ran this inclusion meeting. And so I. As a, as a diversity team, we um, decided to have Anaya come and share this. This is going to be a discussion, um, and I will go ahead and let, let Anaya take it over from here. Thanks, Renee. Uh, hey, y'all. Um, my name is Anaya Robinson. My pronouns are he, him. I am the Associate Director over at Atlantis Community, um, and... I have some slides just to kind of really direct my brain more than anything. Um, if I'm, uh, I don't, Renee, I think you have those. If, if at any point you wanna send them out to everybody. I can do um, that. Go for it. Um, okay. But, um, so I just wanted to start today kind of by talking through um, I think when we have conversations about equity and diversity and inclusion, um, we hear the word safe space a lot and trying to create a safe space to have these conversations. Um, and I kind of like to challenge that a little bit uh, in an understanding of to be able to grow when we're doing work in the equity, diversity and inclusion space, we really have to, instead of creating that safe space, which is very, very important for a lot of us for a lot of different reasons. Um, but for growth to occur, we really have to start creating brave spaces. Um, so I kind of want to talk through the definitions of those two phrases. So safe space is really a place or environment in which a person or category of people can feel confident that they will not be exposed to discrimination, criticism, harassment, or any other emotional or physical harm. So when we're talking about safe spaces and we're talking about people with marginalized identities, um, those safe spaces are really important for us to be able to kind of rest and feel comfortable and feel seen and feel held in our identities um, to be able to recharge ourselves, to go back kind of out into the world, right? Um, but the idea of brave spaces is a place to come together to have hard conversations and hear each other out, even and especially when that is challenging. And in order to, to have these conversations about equity and diversity and inclusion, we really need to open up space to have authentic dialogue in a way that isn't always going to feel comfortable because a lot of aspects of these conversations don't feel comfortable. Um, so some group agreements around brave spaces is um, maintaining confidentiality, 
um, agreeing to assume positive intent. So understanding that somebody in a space of growth may say something that feels hurtful or harmful, but understanding that they are also here to grow and to learn and to use that as an opportunity to, to help that process rather than going in and assuming they said something that felt hurtful or harmful because they were trying to be hurtful or harmful. Um, owning our intention and our impact. So along the lines of assuming positive intent, we want to make sure that we know what our intent was, but understanding as well that the impact that, that our actions and our words have on other people may differ from what our intent was and making sure that we're taking responsibility for that and knowing that regardless of intent, um, our impact is also still really important. Um, agreeing to use moments of discomfort to dig deeper. So during conversations, if we're feeling uncomfortable, understanding that we're in this space together to grow and to learn and to, to become a more equitable community and a more equitable society. And that the way that we get there is to sit in discomfort sometimes and help each other and ourselves understand why that discomfort exists and really digging into why did that make me feel uncomfortable and what ways can I reshape my thinking to not feel comfortable or to use that comfort or that discomfort to leverage my ability to speak up in those moments. Um, showing respect for one another's basic personhood, understanding that regardless of who we are, um, we all have work to do in this journey and that somebody knowing more or less than me doesn't mean that they're any better or worse off than I am. Um, just understanding that we're all human and we're all in different points in our lives and we all have different identities and that all contributes um, and just showing respect for, for every individual regardless of who they are, how they may differ or be the same as us. Um, agreeing to not intentionally inflict harm on one another. I think that one's pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but um, just being respectful, being kind and being open to growth. Um, and agreeing to co that consent must be received to share someone else's story. So I know in these spaces, um, it's really easy to talk about interactions that we've had with other people or stories that other folks have shared about their experience, but knowing that those stories are not our own um, and really honoring the fact that um, it's not my place to share the story or the life of somebody else unless they have given me permission to do so. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts around um, the concept of brave space or um, about any of those agreements? Cool. And if anybody has any questions at any point, feel free to just interrupt me. I, I will not in any way be offended. Um, so when we talk about equity and diversion and diversity and inclusion, um, I think a really important concept that we, we miss out on a lot of the time is intersectionality. Um, so intersectionality is a concept um, that came about in the late 80s um, from a, a, an attorney and law school professor um, named Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, so the idea of intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So when we're talking about inclusion work and diversity work, really understanding that, um, especially within the disability community, um, disability isn't the only identity we hold, right? Um, for, for myself, like my mental health diagnoses aren't, aren't the entirety of who I am. Um, my intersectionality exists as a person with invisible disabilities, as well as a transgender man and a Latinx individual um, and a queer person. Um, and all of that informs who I am and how I exist and move through this world. Um, and no one identity determines everything else about my life, right? It's all interconnected. It all intersects. Um, and understanding that allows us, I think, 
um, oftentimes to have a broader idea of how equity, diversity, and inclusion work really impacts what we do and the society that we live in, while understanding that ensuring that um, we are being inclusive of Black folks, Indigenous folks, people of color. If that's our only lens, we're leaving out a lot of other marginalized groups, and we're leaving out a lot of individuals who hold an identity as a person of color if we're not looking at the intersectionality that exists within us as individuals and us in community. Um, just a quote from Kimberly Crenshaw, who kind of coined this idea of intersectionality. Um, so intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. It's not simply that there is a race problem here, a gender problem here, and a class or LGBTQ problem there. Many times that framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of these things. So kind of that idea that unless we're addressing the issues of inequity in our world with intersectionality in mind, we may only be addressing it for a certain group of people, but not humans as a whole, right? Because there are very few of us who hold a singular identity that contributes to every aspect of our lives. The vast majority of us hold multiple identities um, that help inform and contribute to how we exist in the world and how, how we see the world. Um, does anybody have any, any questions, comments around intersectionality, the idea of intersectionality? JJ? Yeah. JJ? Oh, hi, Anaya. Um, first off, I really love the concept of a brave space. And I also just wanted to point out a semantics thing. Mm -hmm. um, as a fellow Latina, I like the word Latine instead mm -hmm. of Latinx. Have you, I don't know if you've heard that term yet. Can you um, maybe spell out the, the differentiation there? Yeah, so, um, okay, so Latin X uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, Latin and then the letter X. Yes. And it's meant to, just a little history, um, it's meant to um, account for uh, Latino people that are a non-binary mm -hmm. um, and don't identify with the gender. Um, Latine, which is spelled L-A-T-I-N-E, mm. Um, I've heard it recently because it's more, it fits more with um, our Latino culture. So mm -hmm. the point of Latinx is because um, in Spanish, you know, you've got the words that end with A and the words that end with O. So they're already gendered words. And so that the equis was meant to um, take the gender away. But then Latine with the E, it's a non-gendered letter in Spanish. And so mm -hmm talking of intersectionality it accounts for the non-binary population and also it's culturally it's a little more respectful or respect respectful I yeah. don't know if that's the word I'm looking for but it's a little more respectful of the language itself yeah um so yeah I was, just, I was just wondering if you'd heard of that and wanted to point it out I had not heard of that JJ I really appreciate that I I like that um as an option a lot. I think that there's been a lot of conversation lately too, um, especially within the queer and trans and non-binary communities of mm -hmm. um, Latinx as a term feeling hard for a lot of people who really hold um, a lot of space in their history and in their heart for the Spanish language. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that is a really, a really great way to to create space for folks um, who live kind of outside of the gender binary, but also while still honoring the language. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, love, I love hanging out with like new groups of folks because I get to learn things that I wouldn't have learned if I didn't come here today, right? Um, so please, at any point, if anybody um, has any tips or new language that they've heard that seems rad, please feel free to share it. Um, Cause I love, I love learning new things. Anybody else um, 
any thoughts on intersectionality or um, language too, which is a huge part of this work and um, the ideas of intersectionality as well. Anaya, this is Renee. Yeah. And I, one thing that, I mean, I, I, th I think it's important to understand the intersectionality um, because there are, you know, the aspects, like, like, like one thing that if, if I say I am of white privilege, that sparks a lot of contention with some people. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, there are times I, it's not that I'm, um, I'm proud to be who I am. It's just when that, that white privilege thing, because mm -hmm. I've never felt privileged, but going through different um, exercises and stuff, I've realized I am of white privilege. And, and I think it's important to understand that, understand where you're at and, and where, um, what, like, what, what makes up me, yeah. you know? And even though I, I don't like the term white privilege because I've never felt privileged, mm -hmm. um, it's, I think it's important to understand that it does exist, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's a really great segue. Actually, my next slide is um, on privilege. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so Morley, kind of... this is Kevin. Before you go to the next slide, if you want to respond mm -hmm. to her fully, fine. But I, I do have a comment about the language thing when you get yeah. when you get a minute. Yeah. What's your What's your question, Kevin? Before okay, we, to, we'll the, move on to privilege um, in just a minute, Renee. Perfect. Perfect. Because I realize that I am so 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 privileged. The uh, language I have trouble in my writing knowing what's the official term. So if I want to refer to Hispanic people, uh, Latino, Latinx, Latina, it's confusing to me. And I don't mean to. Be, I'm not trying to be a an agitator. I really need to know because I write a lot, and I've looked at style guides and that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, what is what do what would people prefer to be called so that I can speak and write authoritatively? My second point is that uh, intersectionality to me really means a composite of characteristics that come together in one human. Is that that's my understanding of intersectionality? Is that right, or is there more to it? I think it's. I think it, um, to answer your last question first. I think that intersectionality is that, but also with the added component of how all of the identities that make up who we are affect how we exist in the world, right? So I think it's kind of a, a both and, it's the, it's the who we are, but also the impact that that creates. So how, that the multitude of, how the multitude of varying characteristics impacts uh, of people around us, the world, mm -hmm. how we're viewed, et cetera. Yep. Okay, got it. All right, now the first question, and then I'm gone. Yeah, so the first question, I think, um, when we talk about language and addressing other folks with language, it gets tricky, right? And it gets pretty nuanced. Um, I think the best practice is that you're t if you're talking about an individual or a small group of folks, asking them how they want to be identified and the language that they use for themselves is the best course of action. Right, so just asking that question. If you're if you're writing about a specific individual, um, asking how they want to be referred, and if you're talking just about a community in general and not necessarily um, writing about a specific small group or a specific individual. Um, and JJ, I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. But um, I think using using the term that, that helps identify the largest group. Um, so, which is different, right? There's a lot of, a lot of um, Latino folks who uh, are really, um, feel really harmed by the term Hispanic, right? So a lot of folks who are indigenous um, and whose ancestors are indigenous to um, Latin America is uh, the term Hispanic feels hard because that term holds a lot and is pretty deeply rooted in colonization of, yeah. of their indigenous lands. So I think um, the what I tend to do is overuse the term Latino uh, when I'm talking about the, the broader community as a whole. Um, but I don't think that there is a way to utilize a term for any broader community um, without causing some harm or offending someone. Um, but I think making sure that we're doing it with the intent of causing the least amount of harm is what's important. 
and when we have the opportunity to ask an individual um, that we have a responsibility yeah. to do that. Well, so here, this is fascinating. It kind of, and I, and I don't mean to dominate, but uh, it kind of shows us where we are in this because I'm on this uh, committee with, with Renee and JJ and Darian and, and, and Mizza, but it shows kind of where we are. I mean, I had what I think was a simple question and it took you, you know, three mm-hmm. or four minutes to sort of delineate. <laughs> that, that worries me that we're in a place in this society where we have to be on those kinds of eggshells. We really have to work on that now. So I'm going to so, 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 so write about this seminar and I'm going to say we talked about intersectionality. And then when I talk about, am I supposed to use, I just want to know, Latina, Latino, Latinx? JJ? Go for it, JJ. So I'm going to make this even more nuanced. Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at this, guys. Um, I definitely 100% agree with what Anaya is saying because, yeah, if it's a smaller group, a smaller group or an individual, um, you know, everyone's going to have their own preferences. And I, I'm always advocating for ask whenever possible and as many times as possible. Um, I will say for Latinx versus Latine, I just heard Latina like in the last couple of weeks. And for me personally, it just grabbed me. Like I was like, yeah, this is ex-, because Latinx never completely worked for me. I will say that um, I think it's a pretty new term. So I guess the other nuance I'm adding on to this, the other nuance I'm adding on to this is I guess it's a decision of, do you want to stick with the grain of you know the popular term right now is Latinx, or do you want to be part of the movement that says Latina is more of is more culturally is more culturally appropriate? And so I think I'm going to go ahead and mute JJ. But here's what I want folks to do: since I edit the Blind Colorado, and you guys tell me what you want me to call you, send me a because I need to know. I you guys are the audience. This organization is our audience, and so we have a variety of groups. Let me know how I should refer in our writings and social media in terms of the National Federation of the Blind. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Well, and, and Naya, I have a question. Mm-hmm. This is Renee again. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, um, and this, this is something I've heard since I was in college a long time ago. Growing up, first of all, growing up, the word queer mm-hmm. was like, you did not say that. That was like smacking, I mean, that was a, you know, get smacked in the face for from your family. Um, but then, you know, when I, when I when I was in classes in in college, the term came up. Mm-hmm. Is that something that is readily used? Is it only in that population that use it with each other, or wh- what's appropriate? Because I, you know, I I, I used to get smacked for saying that, and mm-hmm. so you know, what what what's so ex- I, I mean, I, I'm I'm gonna circle back to. Um, what I said to Kevin a little bit of, there are a lot of folks within the LGBTQ plus community who identify as queer, I'm one of them. Um, Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of folks within the LGBTQ plus community who still feel really harmed by that word. Um, Generally, folks who are a little older in our community. Are you saying Um, I'm old? No, no. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, that. when I, when I was younger too, that was a word that like, I never, I would never use um, mm-hmm. for fear of harming folks. Um, and I never felt comfortable with until I was well into adulthood. Um, but I think it's a term that for a lot of us, uh, especially folks who don't fall within a, a gender binary, um, feels more complete to explain who we are as individuals. Um, and folks who are cisgender um, still a lot of times will use that term because they feel that it identifies them much better um, than some of the other label options within our community. But I think the important thing is to, to, to kind of honor um, and hold space for the folks who still feel harm from that word. I would, I would strongly recommend not using the label or term queer for anyone who has not told you that that is how they identify. Um, And for the broader community outside of the community, I think using um, terms like LGBTQ+, LGBTQIA+, um, is a lot more sensitive to individuals' feelings within our community 
um, mm-hmm. and their identities as well. Because while, while I feel as an individual that queer really encompasses a lot of the identities within our community as a whole, that doesn't mean that everybody within our community identify as queer. And I wanna make sure that I'm not removing their identity because it feels comfortable to me. Shane? Okay. You have a hand raise from a phone number 2318. Great. Yes. Hi, uh, I, I'm enjoying and appreciating the comments that I hear. Uh, one of the questions has been kind of answered. Uh, I'm from that older group and the word queer had was definitely had negative connotations years ago and I appreciate your explanation. I'm also curious um now, personally, I rarely use any of these terms when I'm talking to someone. I would prefer to say, I have a person I'd like you to meet and not give, you know, specific uh, characteristics to that person. But uh, I, like you say, a lot of people prefer being characterized one way or another, and it's hard to know. So to me, it's just a person or a friend, and that's good enough. Um, and I was also curious about the term binary. I hadn't heard that used before. And if you could explain to me, does that mean the same thing as what we used to use the term bisexual? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, the root, the root of the term is the same, right? So bi meaning two. Um, so the gender binary is this idea that... Um, that there are only two gender options, right? So within the gender binary, there's male and female. And there are a lot of individuals um, who are trans, non-binary, gender queer, um, who, who don't necessarily identify within that binary fully. So understanding that um, gender is fluid and in kind of pre-colonization times, um, there is not an indigenous culture in this world historically that existed with only two genders. Um, So gender, the gender binary really is a product of um, kind of Western European culture and religion um, and this understanding that only male and female exist as options, um, which for for the vast majority of of the world really that's that's not true right we hold a lot of identities outside of those two genders um that are completely valid and real and that gender binary is just this kind of construction of um i think it probably stemmed from an easier understanding of how gender exists in the world because if we have fewer options um we have less that we need to understand about individuals Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I just in addition to that, I uh, I feel that sometimes with all these different definitions and words that come up, it is like the other uh, person said, it's it's just like walking on eggshells. You're just afraid to use any term because it's gonna it's going to upset somebody, and it's really difficult. That's why I try not to use such terms myself and just uh, accept people as people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's true. I think especially with the evolution of language, it's really hard to keep up. Um, So making sure that we are using kind of as neutral language as possible for folks when we don't know exactly how they identify or how they want to be referred to. Um, I think is is really often the most respectful way to go about talking about individuals um, whose identity, pronouns, those types of things we aren't either sure about or um, can't remember or don't know if it's changed recently, all those types of things. Um, or even for folks who, who may use pronouns that we don't feel comfortable using and aren't a part of our general language in everyday use yet. Um, making sure that we're being as neutral as possible is really helpful to avoid any situations where we're misidentifying somebody on accident. Oh, okay. Gary's got, must, must have got your question answered, Gary. Well, Thank I'll, you very much. I'll go ahead then. 
Um, I do identify as a gay, gay person, but in the gay community, I call myself queer or fag or homo. Now, in the blind community, I would not generally use those words. There's a couple of people on this call that I would probably use them with because mm -hmm. that is part of the intersection that we have. And so, Anaya, am I saying your name correctly? Yeah. Good. Thank you. I, um, Thank you. I agree totally. Ask. Ask. Yep. But if you're referring to us as a group, um, you know, gay, bisexual, whatever is good. And there was actually a Shane, I, I'm going to let Shane say this because he actually, uh, Shane typed something down there um, in the comments. And I think that has uh, his comments very interesting. So Shane, I would yield the floor to you. Um, sure. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what I said in the chat is, is that queer can also be a term, an umbrella term that can be used when you want to disclose that you're part of the community, but you don't want to disclose how, um, because, you know, in situations like work um, or other situations, it just, it's nobody's business how you're a part of the community. So queer is a good kind of umbrella term for that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think a lot of, a lot of folks use it that way. Um, and I think it's really helpful. Um, to have a word that kind of denotes the community that we belong to without necessarily fully outing ourselves or giving people entrance into our personal lives that they might not have a right to. Um, that being said, I, I kind of want to circle back to what Gary was saying of util utilizing words that we use to identify ourselves in certain spaces and not in others and the importance that we honor people's ability to identify in different ways in different spaces and make sure that if we are using a word to identify somebody else that we have received permission from them to identify them that way in, in spaces that they did not share. Um, so making sure that we are not inadvertently also outing anyone or using language for somebody that they feel comfortable using for themselves that they don't feel comfortable other people using for them. Um, any other questions? You have a hand raised with, uh, from a phone number ending in 3419. Great. Who is, who's that? And go ahead with your question or comment. You are muted. We have sent a request to unmute. There I did. There you Hi. are. Thank you. Okay. What I'm wondering is, you know, I've heard the term gay used in older cartoons, such the Flintstones will have a gay old time. And then like a Beatle Christmas message, one of them says it's a wonder, been a wonderfully gay year for us. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm just kind of wondering, when did the term gay become accepted you know, among homosexuals and so forth, or bisexual, whatever. I don't want an exact date or anything like that, but it was maybe more in the 80s or 70s, or, cause, or were people ever offended hearing gay used as a happy term? That's my question. Thanks, guys. Uh, that is a really great question that I yeah. don't know the answer to. Um, Neither. So if anybody does... <clears throat> I've heard the term understand. gay used all the time now for what it is used now. Mm -hmm. This is Gary. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, it Gary. was used derogatorially. However, like many derogatory words, yeah. uh, we've now taken them into our community as words of pride. And we are happy. Yeah. Well, let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> My sister, <laughs> you know. Yeah. We are very happy people, yes. We of sure course. <laughs> sure, of course. Morally, but, no, that doesn't bother true. me, but I'd hear cartoons. I'd say, God, they've used that term, happy and gay, and we'll have a gay old time, and mm -hmm. everything just gay or whatever and now it's used of course the way it is now and i you know, accepted it just how well, it is it, so blind used to be considered a word that people didn't want to call us oh i know people, michael hang on a second and most blind people didn't like to be called blind but that is uh obviously it's respectable to be blind the only other comment i wanted to make about this conversation and beyond is i i I think the wonderful thing about our state convention in the National Federation of the Blind is this intersectionality. Mm -hmm. And when I can have a chapter members that work on bake sales with me who 
maybe fundamentalist Christian and have my great friend who uh, is a different believer. And we all come together in the National Federation of the Blind under that umbrella. I just think that's the one you can't do that very many places where you can just come and work on blindness and, and share uh, feelings and 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 uh, intellectual property and ideas and with without worrying about the outside sort of um, everybody's different belief system you learn about them too and you mm -hmm. honor them while you all work together under this federation umbrella I just think it's magic absolutely and I think that's um, one of the great things about understanding and really respecting intersectionality is that when we look at an individual as their whole selves it's really hard to find a way that we don't connect to them somehow, right? So when we're looking at somebody just because, just because I'm trans, um, that identity is, is not in the majority. Um, so when I'm hanging out with cisgender folks, um, my transness does not connect me to them, but it's almost impossible for me to be in a group of people who don't hold another identity that I share, right? So intersectionality, well, it really impacts um, us as individuals with marginalized or oppressed identities. It's also a way that we can connect to, to other people much more easily. Um, so I'm going to move on to kind of make sure that we have some time to address some of uh, Renee's question from earlier around the idea of privilege. Um, so I think that's also a really, a really important aspect of this work is really understanding what privilege is, what it means, um, what the impact is, right? So privilege in and of itself is a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available to only a particular person or group. So the idea of privilege, um, and to use Renee's, uh, Renee's example earlier of, of white privilege. And um, I think it's true for a lot of folks with um, when their intersectional identities come into play, a lot of white folks don't feel like they've really experienced um, white privilege in the way that I think we talk about it often. Um, and that's another play into intersectionality, right? Like privilege exists. Um, people who are white have white privilege, that is true but that doesn't mean that they don't hold other identities that may minimize or mask that privilege a little bit. Um, and then that leads to the experience of that privilege in a different way than say, so somebody who is um, a, a queer, white, blind woman is going to experience their white privilege in a very different way than a like fully able-bodied white cisgender heterosexual man, right? So if we look at kind of the epitome of privilege um, and then everybody else, um, in the same way, Renee is going to experience more privilege because of whiteness than a black blind woman, right? Um, so there's levels, there's layers. And I think the important thing to understand about privilege is that it is not inherently bad having privilege and holding privilege is not a bad thing and it doesn't make us bad folks if we have access to more privileged identities than other people do. It's what we do with that privilege and the impact that that has that holds that power, right? So if we are utilizing our privilege to leverage space and voice for folks who wouldn't otherwise have access, us holding that privilege is a positive thing. If we're using that privilege to just kind of like walk through the world and not notice that anybody else is experiencing anything less than we are, um, that's where it becomes bad, right? Not understanding how our privilege allows us to more easily move through the world. Um, and it doesn't mean that like being a white person with white privilege doesn't mean that your life is easy or that it has been easy or that it will be easy. It just means that there is a level of ease because of being white that people of color do not experience. Um, but it doesn't mean, again, where we have intersectional identities. Just because you're white doesn't mean that you're not a person with dis disability. It doesn't mean that you're not queer. It doesn't mean that you're not poor. Um, and there are different types of privilege 
that interact with all of our identities as well, right? So there is white privilege, there is wealth privilege, there is education privilege, um, there's gender privilege, there's sexuality privilege. All of these things combine to create the experience that we have, the way that we view the world and the way that the world views us and the access that we are afforded because of our privileged identities and our oppressed identities, right? So when we talk about privilege, really understanding that like, I think, I think privilege has gotten this negative connotation in this world. Um, and I really wanna, I want us to be able to separate that out and understand that privilege in and of itself is not a bad thing. It is not an evil thing. It is a very powerful thing. And it's the way that we use that power and the way that we understand our ability to use that power that really drives the impact of the privilege that we have. But having privilege does not make us bad people. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts on, on privilege Tracy. and identity? Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. I, um, I just wanted to say, um, I was in a um, lecture one time and I was being, uh, the person who was talking was a woman of color and she was discussing how, um, and this is something that I am a white person mm -hmm. and um, she was discussing how when she gets up in the morning and she looks in the mirror, she looks in the mirror and she sees a woman of color. Mm -hmm. But when I look, look up in the mirror, I just see a woman. Mm -hmm. And it never occurred to me that um, women of color have to put that woman of color uh, disclaimer on them when they look in the mirror. And um, something, a, a story I wanted to share is um, I also have some mental health um, um, characteristics um, on me. And um, I was in an incident where um, I was having a scuffle with, I was, I was having a scuffle um, with some authorities and um, the whole um, stories that you hear about um, people who of color who have scuffles with authorities and it doesn't end well. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I want to discuss. Um, I It just brought home to me um, how when I had a scuffle with authority, um, because I um, am not a person of color, I believe that it didn't escalate to um, the point of um, tragedy because I do, I do not have um, pigment in my skin. Um, does that make sense? Am I making sense? Yeah. Um, so because, and I think that because I do not have pigment in my skin, I need to speak up um, and um, use my privilege and, um, and talk about the, I don't know where I'm going with this. I think that as a person um, with mental health challenges, um, I need to um, speak up for my fellow peers who might have um, mental health challenges like me, um, who might I don't know where I'm going with this. Never mind. No, I, I just okay. I just think that as as a person who has privilege, I need to be able to speak up for people who don't have privilege. 
Yeah, and I think I think there's a really a really important um, distinction to make in that is making sure that we're identifying the areas of privilege that we have and leveraging them to create power um, for for folks who don't have the same access. And I think in doing that, we do also need to be really careful that we are not speaking for other folks, but that we are using our privilege to create space for the voices of those folks, right? Right, right, we make I agree. Sure that, that we're never, we're really, we're really lifting folks up into the spaces that we have access to, not keeping that space for ourselves and maintaining it and using our position to talk for other people, but to use our position to bring other folks in to speak for themselves. Because um, I think a, a thing that we can often do in this work is, um, is decide that, that because our voice has space, that we should use it. And instead, because our voice has space, we should use that space to give other people voice, right? Anybody else? Jesse's had uh, their hand up for a while here. Hi, um, Jesse Lorenz, a uh, blind uh, lesbian mom living in Colorado Springs. And I was just wondering if you can give some tips on how we as federationists can be better allies Sometimes it seems like the space is very much white dominated or um, like with much love, like it's like Kevin and, and Scott and, and their friends. And I just wonder sometimes how we can open up the space, you know, like I've been in a couple of meetings where I've heard the, some of the racial protests discussed and I was kind of uncomfortable, you know, with some of the conversation there. So I'm just wondering like, how can we as white people be good allies and how can we as a federation, especially in our local chapters, um, open things up to, to promote more um, discussion and inclusion? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think some of that work is done internally, right? At looking, looking at ourselves and understanding our identities and how our identities play into privilege and oppression and how that impacts us um, and how it impacts how we interact with other folks. And I think some of it too is, is intentionally creating those brave spaces to have conversations like this, where people feel open to asking authentic questions um, and open to receiving feedback. Right, I think a lot of this work is is understanding that we're gonna make mistakes, um, and being willing to make those mistakes, and being willing to be told that we have made a mistake and grow from that. Um, so I think I think creating space for these conversations is the first step in gaining more equity and diversity and inclusion in the work that we do within our communities. This is Renee, if I could add something to that as well. Um, you know, Jesse, I totally know what you're talking about. I do. Um, and something that as our committee, our, our division is, is really striving to do is to open up that space so that people can, so that we can in the Federation talk about the differences, the, 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 the similarities, the, you know, whatever, but, but how we are all a part of, of this, this big um, group, but yet all of our differences and how to be proud of those differences as well and not have those racial slurs. And, um, and that's, that's where we're really trying hard to, to focus on this <clears throat> with our diversity corner that we're having once a month and with, with things that we're gonna be bringing to the chapter, to each chapter to discuss some of these things so that we have, an open discussion about it. Now, is everyone going to be open? No, no, we can't force people to do that. But we're, we're trying to offer that space so that these things can be talked about because we are a big federation that we all want to feel that, that, that equity, that, that being included. 
Um, but we want to also embrace our diversity and, and who we are. So um, currently unmuted. Darian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Darian, go ahead. Thank you. Um, one thing that um, you mentioned, a couple of things you mentioned that I really enjoyed, um, the concept of assuming positive intent, the concept of um, our stories that, you know, the idea that our stories are, the, the stories that we share are not necessarily our own stories. So permission to share those stories. Um, feedback. Um, to everyone. Feedback is a big one. And I think it's one of those things of how do Martian we incorporate that into the work that we do in this organization with um, our colleagues, our peers, our friends. If someone says a thing, how do we say, hey, I'm not sure if you knew that, but this is how that came across. Or I like how you said that. That is why it is. And I think sometimes there's fear to give that feedback to um, speak to each other or speak truth to power in a manner of speaking. But I think it is so important that we try to um, be vulnerable and mm -hmm. hey, this is a thing that I want to share with you. It's not easy for me to do. Um, here it is so that people know because sometimes we go we go about in the world, we all do go about in the world and do what we do. And we most of try to navigate things the best way we can, but we don't know the impact we have with each other. So how do we um, say when this happened, this is what this was, or seek to understand even what was the why behind that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and Darian, I love that you used the word vulnerability um, because I think that that is such an important aspect of any area of our lives where we want to experience growth. Um, I firmly believe that growth cannot exist without vulnerability. Um, and we really need to put ourselves in a space of being willing to be open and vulnerable to learn the areas that we need to grow in. Um, and I think it is really important that we, in these brave spaces, not only are we willing to ask questions, but we are willing to really give feedback, um, even when it feels uncomfortable. And that's part of that, like sitting in the discomfort. Um, in allowing ourselves to do this work and to grow from it is, is not only are we gonna may, maybe feel uncomfortable sometimes because we said the wrong thing, but we're gonna have to feel uncomfortable sometimes confronting when the wrong thing is said by somebody else. Abdi? Yeah, Abdi. <laughs> um, something that I uh, I've always thought of is conversation is great, but conversation is not really going to get us anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, simply because if I can give you an example, um, imagine a table of just guys making decisions that affect everyone, including uh, women uh, and so on and so forth. If I, I, I just can't think of anything right now. But um, if you have the conversation and we do have the conversation often, um, nothing really comes of conversation other than understanding. Mm -hmm. But I think if you actually take that word inclusion and include those people at that table, that decision-making table, mm -hmm. that, uh, really, that really takes it from just the, the talking stages to actionable, tangible. I don't want to use the word power, but I can't think of any other word because once you give that power to them and you give that voice to that, uh, uh, and um, like once you give it to that group, the minority, whoever it may be, um, the LGBT community, uh, people of color, women, no matter who it is, I think that's where uh, we actually really go into diversity and inclusion instead mm -hmm. of just having the conversation, if that, if that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that conversation piece is is very much like that baseline foundation building first step. And you can't stay there. Right. That's kind of the gaining that understanding, figuring out what needs to be done and where we need to grow and what we need to do to be able to move forward into action steps. And I think that inclusion piece that you were talking about, Abdi, really moves us into a space where we're able to kind of create an action plan 
to address the things that we discover in conversation. And then it's really that equity piece that allows us to gain those outcomes that we're looking for, where we all have a seat at the table and we all have the same opportunity to give voice. Um, and it's kind of that, that step up, you know, to, we can't, we can't inform action without understanding. So the conversation has to happen and then we need to move it into a plan that it has actionable steps to really move forward to get to the outcomes of equity that we want. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Abdi. Melissa. Yeah, Melissa. Hi, this has been great. But how do we work with kids and adults who have been taught to hate me, for example, because I'm black? Yeah. Or they have been taught that she is totally blind. So you have vision. You have to take care of her. Mm -hmm. So how do we start teaching even blind adults, for example, how to look at us as a person and not just the color or the fact that we don't have vision or we can't walk. I believe we need to start with the young kids Absolutely. as well. So how do we do this by putting it into action? Yeah, I, I think that um, I think that some of it is having those conversations with folks who don't already see us as whole humans. Um, for whatever reason, right? Like whichever of our identities inform their idea that we need help or we, we aren't truly adults because of who we are. Um, but some of it is those conversations. Some of it is really just asserting that like, oh, you're offering me to help or you're offering to help me because you've decided that I need that. I don't, and I'm going to tell you that. Um, and I think some of it too is an unfortunate understanding that because of the society that we live in and because of hundreds upon hundreds of years of this society being built in the way it is, sometimes we aren't going to be able to change people's minds. And in those situations, we don't need those people in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, we, can, we can move on and we can find folks who love us and accept us and see us as our whole selves. And I think that um, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to deal with um, and it's a hard thing to have to accept sometimes. But I think first and foremost, ensuring that however other people see us, we're not letting that inform how we see ourselves. And I, this is Renee again. I, I have a question in, in responding to what Melissa just said, you know, that we need to have our kids, we need to teach the kids to, to, know, to understand. And that, that's where it's really going to make a huge impact, I believe. Um, <clears throat> but I, I have a, I, when my son was two, um, we lived in Colorado Springs at the time. And my son is very pale skinned, very blonde and, he, he never saw a lot of people that are black. He never, we, we, it just, we you know, we, he has cousins that are, we never even, we don't even see them that much. They live on either coast. But um, anyway, we had a, a repairman come and he was black and he was checking the, the oven. And my son was, it was fascinated with him. And I thought he was fascinated because of the tools. Cause he was uh, into tools and stuff. And, at one point, my son said, he was talking to this guy and he said, I like your hammer. I like your, you know, whatever. And then he goes, I like your chocolate lips. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. He just, you know, but then I embraced that. Now in, in embracing that, I said, yeah, he's a different, his skin's a different color, but he's, you know, so, so as did I do that right? <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say, I mean, because I, I didn't want this man to be offended, but I didn't want that, that moment of teaching to, to be gone, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I mean, I, the guy, he was kind of, uh, okay, you know, kind of thing, but I, I don't know. I, I felt it was an important teaching moment, but I don't want to, I didn't want to offend him mm -hmm. either, you know? So 
I think that in moments like that, we need to let the person who has the marginalized or oppressed identity to lead us in how we interact in those instances, right? So mm-hmm. if that individual, if their response is, oh, that's fine, they're a kid, let's talk about it, have that conversation, that's great. If that person is visibly uncomfortable and trying to remove themselves from that conversation, then we need to allow them to be able to do that. And then maybe having a conversation with our kiddo outside of that space, right? Um, sure, but I think sure. it is really important that we are, we are centering the experience and the comfort of the individual who is really going to be the most impacted in that situation. And I think that learning moments are really, really important, but not at the expense of folks who are already experiencing oppression on a regular basis. Sure, sure, okay. Hello, this is, this is Cheryl Fields from Cleveland, Ohio, and I have absolutely enjoyed this session and um, the other session that, I've, that I uh, zoomed in on. Um, but I, I would just like to add um, to the woman that just said about her son, um, I've had moments like that with my children. I'm African-American and I've had moments where um, a, a Caucasian child um, was just really, like she said, fascinated with them. And it is a teaching moment and it's a teaching moment for everyone because if we are not exposing our children or ourselves to other cultures other than maybe through the food experience or the music experience, you know, those real life interactions, then right, it's just gonna be a conversation. If, um, you know, employment um, is a big issue in the blind community and even a bigger issue in the African American blind community, or I should say people of color. Um, and so the, there was another gentleman that talked about action. Um, and I understand having action points, but as individuals, uh, we can make our own action points and try to put our differences to the side and look at each person as a whole dignified individual that deserves respect and acknowledgement for their accomplishments, um, especially um, on a daily basis and um, in the workforce. Thank you. Thank you for having this uh, session. Thank you for sharing that. And I just want to be cognizant. We are three minutes over our time right now. What's that? Um, so I'm going to head off. But if anybody has any questions or needs anything in the future, um, What's feel free that? to email me. It's oh, thank you. Anaya, A-N-A-Y-A, at atlantiscommunity.org. You're going to crash. Um, and I really, really appreciate y'all um, letting me join you today for this conversation. It's been really great. Thank, Thank you, you, Anaya. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Anaya. Great to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. It was a great conversation. I feel like I'm in a revolving door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was some interesting conversation. I heard uh, uh, Opti and I heard uh, Jesse and I really take their point seriously. And I'm glad the committee is going to work on actional items so that we can. Uh, it's got to become more systemic and uh, we've got to make sure that people are not left out. Hey, Kevin, at some point, may I connect with you, please? Yeah, anytime.